Hi and welcome to State of Mind. This is the podcast about everything to do with the mind. I'm Dr. Sham Bhatt and today we're going to discuss an event that is emotionally difficult, widely reported by the press and I think misunderstood by many. I'm talking about the recent tragic event where a mother murdered her own child, her four-year-old son. And obviously everybody is shocked by this because we as a society and as people, we naturally expect that a parent will protect their child and definitely not end up murdering their child. So let's try to understand what might have happened in this particular case. And in understanding this case, let us also understand what is wrong with our society today and what we all need to pay attention to in order to have a happier society. Firstly, let's review the facts of this particular case as reported by the media. So, a lady in her late 30s, I think she was 38 years old, went to Goa with her four-year-old son. And apparently, a few days later, she left Goa back for Bangalore. She insisted that she wants to go back home in a cab, which was highly unusual because it was costing obviously more than the flight and obviously takes longer. But she insisted that she wants to go home by cab, which aroused the suspicions of the hotel staff. They apparently discovered a little bit of blood on the bed sheets in the hotel room. They subsequently called the police who intercepted the taxi. They asked the cab driver on the way they called him and they asked him to take um, her to a nearby police station where the police discovered the body of her four-year-old son in the suitcase in the back of the car. As the facts have emerged, apparently this was a premeditated act where she gave the child some cough medicine to make him sedated. She then smothered him to death and apparently then attempted to conceal the crime. We also know that she was going through a great deal of stress in her personal life. She and her husband, the father of the child, had separated. They were going through a custody battle and apparently a few months prior to this, she had actually filed a case of domestic violence and had prevented her ex, the father of the child, from actually visiting the child. But just prior to this incident, the court had ruled that the father be granted access to the child and apparently this had upset her very much because she did not want this to happen. We also know that she was a professional, apparently an AI scientist and the CEO of her own company and that many of her posts on social media were about her career. Recently, the police also revealed that she had more than 6,000 photographs of her son on the phone and she apparently told her um, told the police that she was attached to her son very much. There are also some reports that the son looked quite a bit like the father. And I'll explain why all of these details are probably important for us to understand what might have happened and why. Now, before I explain what might have happened in this particular case, let us understand this tragic event of filicide or the situation where a parent kills their own child. What does research tell us about it? What do we know about it? Now, there was a very influential research paper published in the late 60s by a psychiatrist, Philip Resnick, who interviewed more than 130 people who had killed their own child. And he divided these uh, cases of filicide into different categories based on what the parents said about why they did that. And here are the categories that Phil Resnick uh, wrote about and one that is widely quoted uh, in the media today. Firstly, he said there's something called altruistic filicide or the murder of a child by their parent when the parent actually believes that killing the child helped the child by reducing or stopping their suffering. Now, this is a situation where the parent actually believes that their child is suffering and is going to suffer as long as they're alive and therefore they have to kill their child. This could be a real problem like a child who has a disease or who is, you know, in chronic pain or has some other kind of physical illness. Or it could be a situation where the parent is delusional. They are psychotic and not in their right frame of mind. And therefore, they believe that their child is suffering because maybe they are possessed or, um, you know, they're suffering in some other way and they have to end that suffering. Now, sometimes a parent, usually a mother, might be suicidal is contemplating suicide and then decides to kill their child because they feel that without them the child cannot survive and so they kill their child and attempt or complete suicide themselves. 
next category is what we call psychotic filicide. Now, obviously, there's some overlap between these categories, but in psychotic filicide, as the name implies, the parent is going through psychosis, which means delusions or hallucinations, which means they're either hearing voices or imagining things, or they have beliefs that are not true. And this is a sign of severe mental illness. And unfortunately, when a mother or a father, particularly again, these incidents are more common when mothers are affected with psychosis. If that happens, then the mother can believe in her delusion that she needs to kill her child. In fact, many, many years ago, I saw a person who had been admitted to hospital and was in long-term care uh, where she had ended up killing her child and then was found not guilty by reason of insanity. And I'm talking about a case I saw when I was practicing in the US. And it was a very, very tragic case, as of course all of these cases are where she began to believe that her child was possessed by the devil. And she was a hyper-religious lady who was going through depression and then became psychotic. And she believed that in order to release the soul of her child, she had to kill her baby. And obviously, this was because she was mentally ill and she was not in her right frame of, of mind. And she ended up killing her baby, attempted suicide, was discovered um, by, by her spouse and then had psychiatric treatment. And obviously, once she recovered from this mental illness and her psychosis dissipated, she became even more profoundly depressed because she realized what she had done. And she had to be kept on suicide watch and there was a lot of treatment required to deal with the tragic aftermath of what had happened. And you know, in these cases, it's a, it's a very difficult case as a professional to see this, your heart goes out to everybody because there is no villain in this piece. Both mother and child are in fact victims of the situation where the mother had a mental illness and because of that, she ended up killing her own child. So this is a category of filicide called psychotic filicide. And then there's a category of unwanted child filicide. As the name implies, in these cases, the child is not wanted. In a classic case described in this um, case series by Philip Resnick, he describes a lady who was a widow, had two young children, and was finding it very difficult to get married because most of the potential suitors would apparently refuse because she was a single mother. And tragically, she ended up killing her children because she saw them as an impediment to her getting what she desired, and they were unwanted children in that sense. Then there's the category of child maltreatment or child abuse filicide. In these cases, the parent has been abusing, beating, been violent to the child for a, for a while, and then the child dies. And so this is a result of child abuse where the child ends up being murdered by the parent. Finally, there's the category of what Philip Resnick called spousal revenge filicide. In this category, the parent kills their child because they want to see the other parent suffering. In these cases, it's almost as if the child is just an object who is murdered in order to inflict pain on the other parent. So these are the categories that Philip Resnick described in his 1969 paper. And it's the same paper that people are quoting all these years later because we don't have enough data about it. Now, there have been other papers, uh, a few case series from France, uh, a few more papers from the US, and what we know about this is that filicide or death, murder of the child by the parent occurs somewhere between seven to eight times per 100,000 people in the United States. We also know that the country with the highest rate of filicide in the world is the United States. And if you compare the rates of filicide in the US versus Canada, it's about eight in, in, in the US and about two and a half to three in Canada. And what that tells you is that there are cultural forces that also are operating within society to cause this to happen. So let's turn to this particular case and ask ourselves what might have been going on in her mind. Now, I just want to underline the fact that I cannot comment categorically in this specific case because obviously I have not seen her. And the only way to be sure about someone's mental health is to have a proper in-depth psychiatric evaluation. Having said that, 
we can form some hypotheses about what might be going on, especially in an attempt to understand society and to understand ourselves, our relationships. Because when we understand the outlier in society, when we understand why somebody has behaved in this bizarre and unusual manner, we then can begin to understand what is rumbling under the surface in society. So outliers, in fact, point us in the direction of what is actually going on more commonly within society, what is rumbling under the surface. And this outlier is only a symptom of that which is afflicting many, many people. Now, what might have happened in this particular case? Well, firstly, in my opinion, it is very unlikely that she was psychotic. It's very unlikely that she was suffering from a serious mental illness that was causing impairment where she was having hearing voices or she had delusions which are faulty beliefs. And I'm saying that because in almost every case of psychotic filicide, the parent makes no attempt to conceal what they have done. Because their belief is that what they have done is right within their delusional worldview. They also lack the ability to plan and to think things through. And so unlike this case, there's usually not a premeditated murder, neither are there attempts to conceal what happened. Now, given what we know about the context of this, about what was happening between her and her ex-husband, it is very likely that spousal revenge was a big motivating factor for her to kill her four-year-old son. It's very possible that she wanted to inflict pain on him and that it was so important to her that he does not get the opportunity to see his son that it led her to actually killing him. Now you might reasonably ask, even if she wanted to hurt her ex, even if she wanted to inflict pain on the father of the child, how could she kill this innocent, vulnerable child, her own flesh and blood? Well, one possibility, and I think this is a strong possibility, is that although she was not suffering from psychosis, she may well be afflicted by what we call a personality disorder. Now, people who have personality disorders are not mentally ill in the sense that they are psychotic and they don't understand reality. But what is different about a person who is suffering from a personality disorder, who has a personality disorder, is that they lack empathy, they may be unable to actually relate to other people's feelings. They may be self-centered, entitled, and narcissistic. I'm talking about personality disorders in what used to be called the cluster B category, which includes borderline personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, and narcissistic personality disorder, and antisocial personality disorder, um, also called sociopathy or psychopathy in, uh, you know, colloquially. In this personality disorder, the child is reduced to an object an object that serves their own needs. And this person who is at once entitled, self-absorbed, and yet very fragile, unable to take care of their own feelings, unable to soothe themselves in the context of a divorce, may be experiencing so much rage, so much anger towards the other partner, that this anger and their personality blinds them, and they end up actually killing their own child. Now, I know that many of you would still say, I don't get it. I still don't get how she could do this. And that's the point, right? It is, this is an unusual situation and many variables like personality, stress, etc. came together in this particular tragic case to cause the death of this child. But as I said earlier, what is really important for all of us is not just to have a morbid fascination with this case, but also to ask ourselves an important question what does this say about our society today? For those of you who are saying, well, it's just an outlier and it says nothing about our society, well, I want you to remember that statistic I shared with you earlier, where the United States has the highest rates of filicide in any developed country in the world. So we know that something cultural, something social, something toxic in society can be working to increase the likelihood of such tragedies occurring. And what might that be? What are these rumblings under the surface that I was referring to? Now, let me share with you some interesting research findings that will help us understand this better. 
Now, firstly, when they were comparing maternal and paternal filicide, that is, when a father kills their child versus when a mother kills their child, and by the way, the statistics indicate that they're about equal, which might shock many people who expect mothers to, you know, perhaps do this less than fathers, but statistically, they're both equally likely to commit filicide. But what they found interestingly was that more than women, men felt, those who, who committed filicide, often felt in that situation that this child was coming in between them and their goals in life, their career, their, their own journey. However, that study was done in the 1960s and newer research shows that maternal filicide rates have actually increased. And I think if we repeated that original study, we would probably find that mothers and fathers who commit filicide are actually now more similar psychologically than they used to be. So that's fact number one. And something to keep in mind is that this study was done about 30 years ago. Now, the other interesting research piece is from the world of evolutionary psychology. Evolutionary psychology seeks to understand human behavior in the context of evolution. So evolution means, of course, that genes that naturally suit the environment are more likely to continue into the next generation. So in other words, if the species has a certain behavior that is not good for their survival, they are not going to survive. So the question from evolutionary psychology is, why would filicide occur at all? Why is the gene for filicide still somewhere there in our species? And does it happen in any other species? Now, when we look at other mammals, we find that filicide does occur through neglect, where a parent will neglect a progeny during times of scarce resources and where the progeny is not fit. Maybe they're born with a defect or they've been injured or whatever. And in those situations, filicide does occur. So what do these pieces of information suggest? And the fact that the United States has the highest rates of filicide. What is this terrible, tragic incident perhaps telling all of us about the society we live in? Well, what it tells us is a few different things. Firstly, it is warning us about the increase in stress levels in general throughout our society. It is telling us that in the pursuit of our career goals, in pursuit of material success, many of us are so stressed that we are not living happy lives. And while most of us are never going to do something like this, perhaps we are hurting ourselves and our families in our quest for material success. The second thing it points to in our society is the growing conflict that parents, particularly mothers, are feeling between the side of them that is nurturing, that wants to be a mother, and the side of them that wants to succeed and compete in career and in the rest of their lives. We are living in a world where the emotions that are so necessary for human happiness, for good relationships, like love, patience, compassion, kindness, well, these emotions are not rewarded anymore. What people are rewarded for is external stuff, how they look, how much money they're making, what clothes they're wearing, how, for, how well they've done in their career, and so on. So this case is warning us that maybe we have all got our priorities mixed up. Next, what this also points to is the growing challenges that people are facing in their relationships. Dating, long-term relationships, marriages, all of these have become much more difficult in today's India as both men and women are struggling to balance their busy lives, their many goals and ambitions, and all the strength, energy, patience, and love and kindness it requires to have good relationships. Finally, this case underlines the need for maternal mental health. The risk for depression, anxiety, and even psychosis goes up tremendously for women in the postpartum period and is something that we should all be aware of. This is indeed a very tragic case, but I hope this explanation, this deconstruction of this case helped you understand what might have happened, not just in this particular case, but hopefully is also a reminder to all of us to revisit our priorities as a society, to make sure that we have a safe, loving, compassionate society for us and our children. Thank you for joining me on this episode. I'm Dr. Shyam Bhatt. 
hal sisu. 